self-heating maxi pad to stick to my <laughs> shoulder neck area today. I can duct tape it to you. Well, I it's I didn't bring it. It was in the garbage now. Okay. My offer still stands. Thank you. Also, I feel like you could just go get like an ace bandage. Do that. It's a little, um, it's an adhesive, oh, it's an adhesive pad and it oh, okay. has these little self-heating, like I think they're probably the same thing in hand warmers. Oh, yeah, sure. I've got yeah. a few of those and then too you for like, my neck. Yeah, for your neck, shoulder, back, whatever hurts. The areas, yeah. as it were. But it just didn't, the one yesterday worked fine. The one today was like, no, nah, I don't want to, I don't want to stick. I'm like, that's kind of half of your job. Is to stick to my body and then heat the area. But no, I did not want to. So there's that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All, All right. right. I'm going to tolerate that sound, but hi. Mm-hmm. Oh, are we recording? Yeah. Well, that's boring as fuck. <laughs> 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 I didn't think it was going to get better than it was, so I like, fuck it. <laughs> Let's just get into this. We're not going to talk about anything more interesting than car trade-ins and muscle pain. Yeah. It's not that kind of fucking day. It's just not that kind of day. Welcome to the most boring first two minutes of a podcast you've ever listened to. Welcome to Ghosts and Hoes. Ghosts and Hoes. Paranormal podcast. <laughs> Your enthusiasm for today is uh, brimming. Yeah. Oh, God. Paranormal podcast where we talk about all things spoopy, cryptids, sometimes aliens, sometimes motherfucking witchcraft, <sighs> murder most fucking foul. The giant stack I have on that chair. Giant stacks, weird giant shit. Giant stacks, weird shit, and muscle pain. A lot, of, a lot of that. A lot of that. Did you take some Advil? Not today. For the inflammation and swelling. Mm, no. Huh. Not until later. So, the word is actually pronounced muscle, right? But Mm -hmm. when you get into the terminology, it's muscular. Yeah. That's weird. (laughs) The fucking English language. Muscle pain. Yeah. Think about that for a second. Muscular. No. And muscle. (laughs) No. (laughs) Because muscular sounds real weird. Right? Buddy, you high? (laughs) Oh, yeah. Definitely. (laughs) But that sounds, muscly is a word. Sounds a lot like something I would say when I'm stoned. Oh, I, know, I know. Which is I appreciate it. It's just hasn't it hasn't happened for a minute. Oh, sweet. Would you and like to? Jesus. I have to go do things after this. I have to go pick up my mom from the airport. I'm not the kind of person that can be stoned and be expected to do things. Okay. That's ah. not Would you like to take some cookies on with you? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I because once once I am in it, I am. When in it? I am. I become my bed. We are one. Because <laughs> you don't want you don't want me in public when I'm stoned. I mean, it's bad enough in my house when I'm concerned about the Mothman being there. So I don't need to know what I would be like in public. You can't handle me in my stoned in public. You don't deserve <laughs> me in my stoned in bed. You're fucking right. <laughs> You're fucking right. <laughs> Hondo P. Hondo P. To that right there. If you can't handle me, my the ocean is the outer space of Earth. <laughs> you don't deserve me at my any other point in time. That is absolutely one of my but, favorites. But I'm not wrong. No, no. No, I would never even attempt to say you were because I agree it's, with you wholeheartedly. Thank you. Wholeheartedly. Sober me stands by what high me said that day. Wow. Also, sober me does too. There was a meme somebody posted recently where it was saying something about how the ocean is, we know nothing about it. And they're like, yeah, that's the point. That's why we're trying to go to space to get as far away from the ocean as possible. <laughs> like, you get it. Whoever said it. You get it. You, fuck, you get it. Thank you. Did we, uh, did we get any Patreon suggestions? Uh, none that I've seen so far. Get your shit together, so, y'all. Do you have any backhoes? A couple. Uh, first, I brought these. Do you oh. need help? No. Okay. I, thought, I don't care what kind they are. They're Doritos. They are Doritos. Uh, you could see it on the back, though, which feels like cheating. Tangy tamarind. Yeah. Okay. I was very curious. Oh, whole fucking bag. I already know it. In the the Walmart yesterday. 
Do you need an adult? No. Okay. Ooh. They, they smell. I don't know if it's good. I mean, no, it's not. It's not bad. Offering my adult services, but I don't know if that counts for much. No. <laughs> no. They smell. Hmm. I don't know why I tried to put these in front of my microphone, as if my microphone was going to smell it as well. <laughs> I want this one. Ooh, she. They're red. red. They're very she red. She got a lot of spice on there. <laughs> it's hard to explain what it smells like. It, it smells like Dorito, but also not. Not. But it also doesn't smell like tamarind. It smells like ramen powder. Yes. Yes, it does. That's it. That's yep. exactly. It smells like, like ramen, ramen powder. powder. Okay, exactly. we're ready. Oh, uh-huh. wait, no, you don't have one. I'm going to pick a good one. Uh, hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Hmm. Oh. It's got like a limey. Very mm-hmm. limey. Yeah. I, it just, actually, it just tastes like lime. Yeah. It yeah. just tastes like a lime chip. It's, yeah. like, it's, it's sour and a little spicy. A little spicy. Got a little tang. I like that. Those are good. Got a little Wu Tang to it. It's not over, y'all. <laughs> it's not over. It's yeah. not over, y'all. No, I like those. I don't know if I could eat a ton of them because mm. I feel like they might be I'm too. Probably gonna. It might be too sour for my mouth mm. to eat like a whole bunch at one time. But I just don't want to. I like them. So there's that. There is. That. All right. Now uh, back hoe away. Yeah. Hang on. I gotta. Oh, you poor thing. Turn your whole body to grab your paper. Mm-hmm. I sure do. That's no fun. Uh, shout out to our new patron, Christy. Hey, Christy. Hey. What up? Um, and then. What up, how? <laughs> I had to go back and figure out the names of the child actors from Black Phone because it was going to drive me crazy to not mm. give them the credit mm-hmm. that they so rightly deserve. So first, uh, Finney was played by Mason Thames. Uh, Gwen was Madeline McGraw. Robin was played by M- uh, Miguel Cazares Mora. And the metal kid was named Vance in the movie. Okay. That was his name, but I couldn't find what she called him, like Pinball King or something. And then the guy I was thinking of that Finney looks like the child version of was the actor named Chris Mulkey. What's he in? Um, that's another question. The only thing I remember him from was the show Any Day Now on Lifetime with Annie Potts. Um, but I know he's been in a fuck ton. He's one of those guys where you're just like, oh, that guy. He's got, he's he's the face where you're like, oh, it's that guy. But I cannot for the life of me remember off the top of my head. And then someone sent me a recent news article, uh, regarding D.B. Cooper. Oh! Yeah. So this is an article from King5.com by Chris Ingalls Mm -hmm. from July 20th. Uh, Three particles lifted off the necktie of D.B. Cooper are providing an intriguing new clue in the unsolved 50-year-old skyjacking. Um, An amateur sleuth believes that the microscopic metals are telltale evidence of the skyjacker's employer at the time he jumped from the Boeing 727 airliner over the Pacific Northwest on November 24th, 1971. And let's skip around. Blah, 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 blah. Blee, blue, blue. And this is um, Eric Ulis of Arizona, who has been uh, searching for D.B. Cooper and some answers for 14 years, which is impressive. Especially it. in an unofficial capacity. So he says, I believe that we have identified not only the company where D.B. Cooper came from, but also the specific division within the company that D.B. Cooper came from. Um, so Ulysses' evidence comes from a scientific report that was produced 10 years ago by a team that the FBI invited to analyze evidence in the cold case. Um the skyjacker is believed to have discarded the tie on seat 18E of the aircraft before he leapt from the plane. Just a little recap if we remember all of this. Right. Um, so he continues on to say, I've been looking for something that I would call a tantamount to commercial DNA. The idea being that just as human DNA points to a specific individual, commercial DNA um, close to a specific company. And indeed, I actually found three particles of a very unique and very rare alloy. <clears throat> so, all that said, those particles mm-hmm, led mm-hmm. him to a company based in Midland, Pennsylvania, 
called REM crew that manufactured titanium antimony, which is one of the particles found on the tie, which is not at all um, a common thing. So he believes right. that because it had such limited distribution, the titanium antimony on Cooper's tie is strong evidence that the Skyjacker worked at REM crew at some point. Uh, he says, I've managed to isolate one person in particular, one person of interest in particular that I'm looking into that appears to check several of the boxes. I'm not releasing the person's name publicly for obvious reasons, but I'm going to continue to look into him. And Yeah, that company no longer exists, but um, that is a little update. So they think that it, he may have worked at that company in Pennsylvania. Huh. Mm -hmm. Since it was like... I think one of the only places that had that specific okay. metal well, that they right. would work on. Very fucking interesting. Right? I was like, oh. So maybe he I'm didn't a, work at Boeing. I'm a big term of the term skyjacker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a thing. I want, I want that on a shirt. Skyjacker? skyjacker? Mm -hmm. The implication. <laughs> yeah. Sounds very good, very dirty. It skyjacker? Does. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. thought you'd be way more on board with this. And I'm into it. Into it. Totally into I'm it. Into it. Ow! <laughs> Here it is. I can't even mention. There it is. I can't. I can barely think of a word that resembles any kind of genitals in this room without somebody pointing it out and skyjacker is the one that you completely miss that's the one i see how it is fuck man took me a second clearly a few huh. a few seconds yeah. i want <laughs> oh goodness. everything i'm so glad we captured that we are recording yes we are good good, good god glad you got that well, fuck, oh. fucking A. Uh, so I go for, yep, all right. She, I, she, she <laughs> fucking pointed at me. Mm -hmm. That means it's me. It's me now. I can't, I can't turn my it's head to right. look at you. So. Well, and y'all know what I'm doing. So oh, let me just uh, put my spectacles on. Oh. What is it? Spectacles, testicles, wallet, and watch. watch. Yeah. Yep. And if anybody asks, I don't know what I did. It just started hurting in the middle of the day yesterday. Oh, okay. Yeah. My, yeah. Can't That's turn, exactly. can't turn my head. She's all tweaked. The left. Uh, I can kind of turn it, but I really can't tilt it. Sucks. Real yeah, quick, yeah. the spectacles, testicles, wallet, and watch thing is supposed to be mm -hmm. sign of the cross, correct? Yep. yep. What human being has a wallet on uh, on either side of their chest? A gentleman with a sport coat that has a pocket on the inside for because his... pocket watch too. It's the same thing yeah. it's from that time. It's a very mm. old. No, I know. I so it's it's been... real old. I just couldn't figure out like who's it would have been wallet on the inside of the like a coat. like a money clip and a pocket watch. Okay, all right. Yep. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hey. hey. <laughs> Answers. <laughs> you're welcome. So today, no. Hey, if if you're just now. Oh, to... that's right. If if you're if you're somehow just sort of coming into the podcast and be like, hey, I'm going to start with this episode, go fucking back, go just go back. Mm -hmm. um, especially for my story, you can start on last week and then go back to the beginning because you really should. You gotta hear but, Nick. But <laughs> you gotta hear all the Nick episodes before you get me. So um, you can truly uh, appreciate. That's the penance you pay. Yes, because today is a part two. Um, of the bad business of body brokers. So now let's talk about some really fucked up shit. Are y'all ready? Should we Should we give a quick recap? Um, no, that's why I told him to go back to last week. Fair, okay. Yeah, yeah. Fuck so. anyone who doesn't remember. Go listen again. <laughs> it was a week ago. Oh, okay. Unless they're like listening. Body brokers, guys. We're talking about body brokers. People who uh... donating your body to science and what. More Might than actually likely, happen. potentially happen uh -huh. if you are not really clear with. If if you're not thorough in your investigation of who you're donating your body to, mm -hmm. this it can get real grim and grisly. Um, mm -hmm. This is a possibility. That's why you always got to vet your sources thoroughly and be thorough. Thorough. Or else thorough. your body could be used for um, weapons testing. Yeah. Or worse. Or As we'll find out this weekend next, mm -hmm. much, much worse. Or some dark web 
fuckery. Shit. Yeah. yeah. So, Arthur Rathburn was hired in 1984 by the University of Michigan Body Donation Program, which uses cadavers for anatomy classes and research. He was 30 years old at the time, with a community college decree, decree degree, and a kick-ass work ethic, which made his colleagues really appreciate him. And the university archives show that Rathburn helped the program rebound from many complaints by donor families about shitty customer service. So at one, one point, it sounds like he was decent enough, anyway. Um, William Burkle, who supervised Rathburn at the University of Michigan, said he was just energetic, doing something all of the time. He had a lot of ideas. One of these ideas even merited a publication in a scientific journal and a patent. It was a state-of-the-art embalming and autopsy station, which was a device that promised safer and easier preparation of dead bodies. In 1988, Rathburn was prominently featured in the monthly Ann Arbor Observer newspaper, talking about the significance of cadavers in the classroom. Um... Also, in 1988, a friend bet him $10 he wouldn't fill out a funeral home job application, which he did. Huh. Weird bet. I don't know. Two years later, however, Rathburn left school following unspecified allegations of misconduct, and he got a court order barring the release of his personal records. But after his eventual arrest which I will get to much later, two people with direct knowledge came forward and said that Rathburn had mishandled donor parts and ashes, which is a cardinal sin in the funeral industry. But at the time, with that information shielded from the public view, Rathburn set out in the early 90s to sell body parts, creating his company, International Biological Inc., which he would run with his wife, Elizabeth. One of his first clients was Ed Eichenlaub, then a doctor's assistant in Pittsburgh who started working with Rathburn to supply body parts for research and surgical seminars. I would call Art up and say, I need half dozen human heads. Later, iClub said he worked for Rathburn handling body parts at medical seminars in New Orleans, San Francisco, and Chicago, saying, I won't lie to you, it was creepy. You arrive at this place, there's this huge ice chest, and you open it up, and there are a dozen heads. They're wrapped up, but it takes a special person to do this. So now, as I talked about last week, most state laws are generally really gray when it comes to body brokering, but perhaps no agency in America imposes tighter controls on body brokers than the New York State Health Department. New York requires licenses, inspections, and annual statistical reports for any broker, even those not based in the state, that ships body parts to customers in New York. And where am I? And their state health officials travel around the country to inspect these brokers. And in 04, a New York inspector traveled to Rathburn's warehouse in Detroit. So, New York ain't playing. Mm -hmm. Um. They never do. Mm -hmm. Rathburn was given a week's notice of the visit, but when the inspector still found serious deficiencies, unfortunately, the words are hard, apparently. We gotcha. Yeah, uh huh. Rathburn was given week's notice of the visit, but inspector, the inspector still found serious deficiencies. The biggest red flag on the list, Rathburn could not produce documents proving that the bodies were donated willingly. And the inspector's report said... There are no such records for whole bodies and body segments received for use at the facility. That's a big fat fucking red flag. Mm. Yeah. No consent forms, no nothing. Yeah. So in 06, officials told Rathburn that he could no longer ship body parts to New York until he resolved their concerns. But then in 07, New York health officials issued him a provisional license allowing him to resume operations. Mm -hmm. And the records show that from 2005 to 2007, his business went on in full force outside of New York as he distributed more than 200 severed heads. At least one broker voiced concern during this period, Walter Mitchell, former owner of an organ body donation firm, BioGift. He said he stopped supplying body parts to Rathburn after an 06 incident where a week after shipping two human torsos to Rathburn in Detroit... Mitchell got a call from the airline saying that uh, no one had picked up these packages and 
the coolers were leaking and starting to smell. No, 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 right. no, 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 no. Mitchell called Rathburn, like, bro, what the fuck? And the torsos were eventually picked up, but BioGift wasn't going to work with him ever again. Yeah, I mean, that's probably for right. the best. In the mid-2000s, Rathburn launched an ambitious expansion that would lead to bankruptcy. In 05, his company bought a funeral home and warehouse in Richmond, Virginia for $1.8 million. Former city councilman Bill Pantel said they were going to bring in loads of cadavers to be stored at the warehouse and, as needed, transferred to the funeral home, then to medical training events. Having invested a lot of years in revitalization of that neighborhood, I thought, this is a bad idea. The community agreed and fought back. Rathburn abandoned the plan, and even though his Michigan company grossed almost $900,000 annually from 06 to 08, the debts mounted. By late 08, when Rathburn's company declared bankruptcy, and as part of the bankruptcy filing, Rathburn provided a list of assets. The inventory included 14 chairs, 10 file cabinets, 91 heads, 18 spines, 6 hips, and a copy of the Hippocratic Oath, which is fucking laughable, considering. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. So, despite the bankruptcy, Rathburn continued to operate his parts business. Through 2013, six body brokers shipped him more than 800 body parts worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, the court and New York Health Department records show... Federal authorities came into contact with Rathburn or his employees a dozen times, including six border crossings from 2010 through 2013. In 2010 and again in 2011, federal law enforcement records show Rathburn was stopped coming back into the states from Canada, and each time he was carrying 10 human heads. Wow. This guy's really into heads. Yeah, no shit. Really, really, really into heads. He really likes heads. In 2012, picnic coolers containing eight heads and red liquid arrived from Israel at the Detroit airport being sent to... What? Yep. Nope. Wow. (laughs) Okay, you got it. Yep. Uh Uh-huh. So in 2012, picnic coolers containing eight heads and red liquid arrived from Israel to the Detroit airport. Border agents confronted Rathburn, and among the lies, Rathburn told them that the liquid inside the coolers wasn't blood, but Listerine mouthwash, which he used to preserve the specimens. Lies, it was blood. No, 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 no. I've I've never, number one, seen red Listerine. They make it. I'm sure they do, but guess what? It's not going to smell like death. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. It's a very strong antiseptic. But Yeah, which would be a welcome smell in comparison. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. This incident was the one that accelerated the investigation of Rathburn, though no one intervened to search his warehouse or stop his business at the time, which they fucking should have, because seven months later, this motherfucker sent a cadaver infected with hepatitis B and HIV to a medical convention in Washington, D.C. Although, those surgeons would later, they wouldn't learn of the potential danger they were in for several years yet. Wow. But this was the incident, the heads from Israel was what really got the feds, the FBI, going, huh. And it's because it was international. Mm -hmm. And so that's what really got the feds looking into body brokering and all of that. So Rathburn and his wife Elizabeth were indicted in January 2016 following a years-long federal investigation. The FBI and border officials were on his trail for years, but it wasn't until December 2013 that they zeroed in on him and raided his warehouse in Detroit. Agents seized more than a thousand body parts, heads, hands, legs, torsos that were then stored in a deep freezer at the Wayne County Morgue, as well as four preserved fetuses. No one knows what he was going to do with those. This guy's real gross. Rathburn stored remains frozen together, flesh on flesh, and remains were often stored among pooled and or leaking blood and other body fluids. Mm. He did not disinfect tools between dismembering cadavers. For various periods, his warehouse did not have electricity or running water. And I missed an entire sentence that was written by the assistant U.S. attorney, Timothy Wise. Um, 
Rathburn stored human heads by stacking them directly on top of each other without any protective barrier. So this dude just had heads stored all willy-nilly. And keep in mind, y'all, he used a chainsaw to chop up bodies. Can you fucking imagine how that chainsaw smelled without being cleaned? I don't want to. He didn't clean it either. I There's don't, no way. Well, yeah. I don't no, and that's what he was saying. That it's... um, it, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. He didn't clean or disinfect tools between dismembering cadavers. Ugh. And for various periods, his warehouse didn't have electricity or running water. No. Like, what the fuck? What the actual fuck? So, in March 2016, Elizabeth Rathburn agreed to a plea deal admitting that in 2012, she took the body parts contaminated with Hep B and HIV to the American Society of Anesthesiologists Conference in Washington. And she also filled out a form declaring that the remains had tested negative for HIV and hepatitis A, B, and C. Hmm. Now, I know there's not a laws and rules and there's a lot of gray area, but guess what you can't do? You... That. Literally anyone can sell body parts, but you can't sell diseased no. body parts. No. But Arthur and Elizabeth Rathburn sometimes obtained diseased remains from their suppliers at a reduced cost, and according to prosecutors, Rathburn made $2.7 million dollars. 20% of his business from the remains of uh, corpses infected with HIV or hepatitis. Jesus no, Christ. That's not good. And he sent them to researchers involved in 142 <sighs> medical courses. Oh, that's not good. Nope. U.S. Attorney Barb. Barb, why are words hard? Because they are. Barbara McQuaid, who was a U.S. attorney at the time, said this alleged scheme to distribute dise diseased body parts not only defrauded customers from the monetary value of their contracts, but also exposed them and others to infection. The alleged conduct risked the health of medical students, dental students, and baggage handlers. Yeah. Yeah. So Elizabeth pled guilty to wire fraud. Oh, Okay. Because, you know, again, the whole law is in the gray yeah. area. And she agreed to testify against her then-estranged husband. Now, remember the chainsaw? Mm. Well, according to the indictment... Wish I didn't. Mm -hmm, Arthur Rathburn used a chainsaw, band saw, and reciprocating saw to oh, dismember bodies no. without taking sanitary precautions. Well, yeah, because guess what? Number one, those aren't medical tools. Mm -hmm. Well, not anymore in the case of a chainsaw. Thank fuck. Yep. Um, number two. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, she, <laughs> right. She reiterated that, yeah. That itself was a point. It was a good point. And I'm glad I made it. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I made it. She reiterated his storing human heads by stacking them directly on top of each other without any protective barrier in between, disregarding any risk of cross-contamination between infectious and non-infectious remains. Pools of frozen blood and bodily fluids were found in the freezers. Ugh. So now I'm sure all of you are putting two and two together. It's the chances of cross-contamination was pretty fucking high because this motherfucker kept no records. There's no way to determine how many contaminated parts were sent out or to whom. It's a literal cesspool. Yep. In there. Lit literal. Yeah. Literal. It's just what that's yep. what that is. I would like so, to refer you back to point number two I made. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. So in January 2018, Arthur Rathburn was convicted of fraud and shipping hazardous materials and sentenced to nine years in prison. U.S. Attorney Matthew Schneider said, We hope this sentence brings closure to the victims of Arthur Rathburn. Rathburn's disgraceful conduct not only put the health of innocent people at risk, he showed a complete lack of regard for the donors and their families who are all victims. Elizabeth Rathburn was sentenced to 24 months probation and a joint restitution with her husband in the amount of $55,225.83 to be paid to the American Society of Anesthesiologists. Hmm. I like how anesthesiologists is a word that you can say, but not, not Barbara's last name. Yep. Or Barbara. Yep. I think. Yep. It's one of those days. Yeah. Yeah, words. Yeah. Words. Words are hard. <laughs> so um, that is the conclusion of part two. Do it, if you will. Do it, if you will. Yeah. So, and then, um, yeah, part three will be uh, next motherfucking week. And we just got, mm -hmm. uh, you know what? No, I'm going to leave that. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, whatever he said. Yep, okay. All right, well, what you got? What you got? 
She's got a fucking long one. It's not. What you got? What you got? It's not that long. Um, so, I was asked recently what my favorite genre of horror movie happens to be. Mm. And even though they're my biggest dope, mm-hmm. the bitch will always love a good possession movie. Oh, same. Hard same. Yep. Our first date. Good. It is our, that was our first date. That was our first date. Stanford's in the movie at the Lloyd Center. Connect the cuts, connect the cuts, connect the cuts. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so they're, they're, they're generally the ones that sit with me the longest and freak me out the most mm-hmm. in the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, I watched one a few years ago that was allegedly based on a true story. So that is the story I will be telling you all right now. Mm-hmm. This is today. I'm going to talk about the Bayecas case, a.k.a. the possession of Estefania Gutierrez Lazaro. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, Estefania Gutierrez Lazaro was born in Bayecas, South Madrid, Spain, in 1973 or 74 mm-hmm. uh, to parents Concepcion Lazaro de uh, Iglesia and wow. Maximo Gutierrez Palomeres. Wow, look at you. Thank you. Uh, she was the third of six kids, uh, Rubina, Marianella, Ricardo, Maximiliano, and Jose Luis. Great names all around. Very great. And the family lived in an apartment at Calle Luis Marin Ocho. Eight. Eight. that. <laughs> in the Palomeras uh, Sureste area. Uh, this is just about all of the history I could find on her, uh, as there's not a ton of information about her early life out there. And what little information I could find varies from resource to resource. That said, I tried to put this together the best as I could. Uh, It's because I think it's another instance of certain details getting lost in translation over the years. Um, Because, again, it takes place in Spain, pre-the internet. Pre-interwebs. So, yeah, that. And then I think the movie that eventually came out played a lot into some of the things that people said about it. I'm guessing you're holding the title of the movie till the end. I am. Okay. Ow. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to move and it hurt my body. Um, but yeah, so pre-internet, of course, it was about possession. So people are going to be like, oh, maybe let's not throw that out there. And many other reasons. So there's a lot of discrepancies. I'm just going to put that right out there mm-hmm. up front. Um, I did find one piece that said uh, she was kind of bullied in school a little bit. She was um, a little bit heavier set. Uh, Her family wasn't very wealthy. So I think she got made fun of a lot for that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, But I could only find that in one source. So, again, uncertain. Mm -hmm. Any hoops. Back to it. Uh, Estefania attended school at Colegio Aragon, and let me tell you that fact caused me to dig many of my own goddamn chupacabra holes, which I will get to in a second as to why. Uh, By all accounts, Estefania was a typical teenage girl, and none of us were immune to the idea of the occult in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. This took place pre The Craft, but I do remember a little witchy wave even before that movie came out. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, the whole tidal wave of Teenage Wiccans came once we'd all seen it. But anyhow, back to the story. In March of 1990, Estefania and a couple of her friends decided to hold a seance in the bathroom at school. Uh, Allegedly, their teacher was out sick that day, so they just decided to ditch class and hold a little seance. Uh, Estefania allegedly brought a homemade Ouija board and a small glass to act as a planchette for the occasion. Mm -hmm. Uh, They intended on trying to make contact with one of the girls' boyfriends who had died in a motorcycle accident just to check in and, you know, see if he was all right wherever he was. Mm -hmm. Some accounts say that Estefania's sister, Marianella, was present as well, but was acting as a lookout on the other side of the bathroom door, just in case, you know, any teachers. Just in cases. Teachers, whatever. She's like, she was their little girl, uh... Look out. Mine canary. <laughs> <laughs> so Estefania had apparently used a Ouija board several times, including on her own, and didn't see any issues with using the board as a means of communicating with the other side, as I've said 
multiple times on the show. I agree that spirit boards of any kind are just another tool in the arsenal of a paranormal investigator, and the stigma attached largely largely comes from movies like The Exorcist. Correct. Uh, Because, you know, early stages of satanic panic and all that fun stuff. Um, That said... Just like using a spirit box, you have zero control over who or what communicates with you. So, you know, always use uh, caution Mm -hmm. when investigating or dabbling. Uh, You gotta protect yourself. Mm -hmm. And three teenage girls in a bathroom. Hmm. Guess what? Didn't happen. Maybe they didn't do that. Yeah. So... As is common with Ouija boards, at least in my experience, nothing much happened during the seance. Uh, And before anything really could, uh, a teacher by the name of Dolores Molina came into the bathroom, confiscated the homemade board, and broke it in half. Depending on the source, the glass, which I'm assuming was like a little shot glass, maybe just like a small glass, Mm -hmm. um, it either shot off the board and shattered on its own before the teacher took it away, or it fell onto the ground and broke when the teacher snatched the board away. Either way, the girls reported seeing a strange wisp of smoke hover over the, they had like a little makeshift table, mm-hmm. uh, hovering over it and then shooting into Estefania's nose and mouth. Oh. Uh, the teacher corroborates this, by the way. Okay. The girls were sent back to their classes, and that was that. But of course, it was just the beginning. Now, there are some accounts that say the girls were interrupted by a nun, while others say it was a teacher, and some sources name her Dolores Molina was the teacher there. Um, and this is where my brain went absolutely off the rails. I tried to find out if the school was a Catholic school at any point in time. It doesn't look like it. And from what I could find, it's just a public school that was founded by the city council. Okay. Um, I couldn't find anything on what the school was like in the 90s, but now it appears to mostly be a primary school for kids up to 12 or 13 years old. Uh, religious studies are offered there, but the classes are optional. Why is this important? It's not, really. Um, but I needed to know. If the nun, if the was, nun the was a real person or someone that had been added to the movie to make it creepier and people just went with it when writing about the case after it came out. Uh, I can't say for certain, but I get the strong feeling that she was just a teacher, not a nun. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't really know. Yeah. So that's just my addition to that. Uh, but I thought I'd share with my, my mini breakdown with you guys because why the fuck not? Like, legit looked into that for way too long. Like, (laughs) an entirely inappropriate amount of time was spent (laughs) looking into that. (laughs) Uh, Like, I I discovered, like, there's a whole thing happening in Spain about religious teachers and stuff now. Like, it looks like you can get a certificate to be... To teach religious studies, I think. And I was like, well, this is, a, right. this is a whole thing. So could that have happened? Maybe. There's no information on if that was available in the 90s. Right. But, yeah. I was like, why are we still here? What are we doing? Can you move on to something else? My brain said, no, I need an answer. And I'm like, well, you're not getting one. So. Just had a whole last conversation with your brain. Sure did. Yeah. I had multiple times a day. Mm-hmm. 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 So after the seance at the school, Estefania's behavior changed almost immediately. It started with bouts of insomnia, and when she could manage to sleep, she was plagued by horrific nightmares. Uh, She would later tell her mother that she dreamt of faceless, shadowy figures surrounding her bed, whispering at her to come with them. The worst part? Those visions continued while she was awake, uh, as Estefania would go, or she would also claim to frequently see the shadowy, faceless beings creep by her room. And as if that weren't awful enough... Estefania started becoming withdrawn and even hostile towards her family. She would bark, growl, and hiss at her siblings, and on a few occasions, she became violent towards them. Uh, But when asked why she'd behaved that way following an outburst, she had no recollection of it even happening. Uh, Her sister Marianella would later explain that she was not aware of what was happening. Then uh, Then she asked what she had done because she could not remember anything. She was kind of like black out and start growling and lunging at her siblings. Right, right. Yeah. And it said she was kind of like a maternal figure to them. I think she may have been the oldest girl. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and she was like an extra mom right. and like really sweet from what everybody said later but this was very out of character for her so she scratched the walls and started having seizures. Yeah. Uh, her mother, Concepcion, also reported that Estefania would go into trance-like states for up to 20 minutes at a time. Nothing seemed to bring her out of these catatonic states. And if you think they sound creepy now, <laughs> it gets worse. Ow. Um, while in these states, Estefania was known to make weird guttural noises, speak in languages she didn't know, which I learned is something called glossolalia. Uh-huh. Uh... -huh. uh she apparently had conversations with people no one could see, but worst of all, she would laugh while in this trance-like state, hysterically. Oh, I don't like that. No. I dislike that. I hate it. I dislike it. Uh, yeah. Uh, Concepcion reported that when Estefania eventually came to, they would ask her what had happened, and she would tell them that she had been in a long, foggy corridor where unseen entities called out to her. Uh, were they the same sinister shadow figure she saw in her room? She seemed to think so. Ah, huh. uh, yeah. Uh, side note: as someone with epilepsy, this could have potentially been something called an absence she absence seizure, uh, which was also known as a petite mal seizure. Okay. Um, I've had plenty of these in my day, and was always incredibly annoyed when my grandma would catch me daydreaming because she'd ask me if I'd heard what she just said, mm -hmm. uh, because that is kind of what it looks like. Those seizures, you just kind of, like, stare into space. You'd be like, yes, Jan, I heard you. I'm just daydreaming about cute boys, please. Like, <laughs> I am 15 and irritated. Just let me daydream about that cute boy in my math class. God damn it. Not having a seizure right now. Leave me alone. Um, but absent seizures don't last that long. They only last, like... 15, 30 seconds, mm -hmm. usually. Mm -hmm. Definitely not 15 to 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, they're also typically seen in children between the ages of 4 and 14. It's not uncommon for them to happen in older people, but not as common mm -hmm. as that age group. Uh, another possibility is that Estefania was having complex focal seizures during these episodes. Uh, according to Hopkins Medicine, complex focal seizures are often uh, preceded by a simple focal seizure or aura. Patients experiencing a complex focal seizure may stare blankly into space or experience automatisms, non-purposeful repetitive movements such as lip smacking, blinking, grunting, gulping, or shouting. So, could have been potentially a complex focal seizure when these trances were happening. Yeah. So, as it always does, the mysterious ailments plaguing their daughter got worse. Right, right. Uh, on one occasion, Estefania went into the bathroom to iron some clothes. Uh, she yelled, causing Concepcion to run into the bathroom and see what had happened. Uh, according to Estefania, she had seen a shadowy figure and the iron had turned itself on. Uh, Concepcion checked the iron, and it was definitely on, but not hot. The door to the bathroom suddenly swung shut, and neither woman was able to get the door open. Uh, Maximo, Estefania's father, stepped in and tried to open the door, but couldn't get it open either. Uh, he raised his leg, fully prepared to kick the door down, but it opened all, its, all, all on its own, Ooh. just by itself. Uh, neither woman had touched it. Another quick note, the family would later report a lot of paranormal activity taking place in the bathroom, specifically near the tub. Estefania's bed was on the other side of the wall, next to the tub, and she often reported that the voices seemed to be coming from there. Oh. So, haunted bathroom? Maybe. Sure. Uh, obviously worried about their daughter, Maximo and Concepcion took Estefania to multiple doctors to find out what was going on. She went under... Tons of various tests. Unfortunately, no one found anything physically or mentally wrong with her. She was apparently treated for epilepsy with medication, with zero results. And according to a couple of sources, Concepcion was allegedly an epileptic herself, though she had been treated successfully for many years and shared no symptoms with her daughter outside of seizures. Okay. Um, with no medical or psychological diagnosis given, Maximo and Concepcion turned to a priest for help. Mm -hmm. Again, nothing came of it. Uh, they discovered books on the occult and the paranormal in Estefania's room and promptly removed them just in case. But that did nothing to help the situation either. Uh, as Estefania's behavior worsened, the paranormal activity in the home ramped up. 
Things in the apartment would move around on their own. Lights and other devices would turn off and on by themselves. Doors would slam shut and lock. Uh, One source claims that a small fire started in the kitchen one day, though it was extinguished quickly and no one and nothing was harmed. Uh, Estefania's younger sister, Marianella, claimed to see her sister levitate over her bed in the room that they shared. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, I don't like it. Uh, And everyone in the house started witnessing the shadow people. Estefania also started to say really bizarre and cryptic things, like telling her parents that she was going to die before them. Uh, uh, She asked Concepcion not to tell Maximo's family that she was going to die soon and that she didn't want them at her funeral. Oh. Uh, And she requested to be buried with a certain photo of her and her father. That's weird. According to her brother Ricardo, one of these statements, or premonitions, was made the day before tragedy. Uh, one day in July of 1991, Estefania attacked her sister Marianella, and this is a quote, as if she were a rabid animal. Oh, shit. Yeah. Marianella managed to outmaneuver her sister, who then fell to the floor and had a seizure. Uh, like a big grand mall foaming yeah. at the mouth. Ooh. Seizure that are the kind of seizures I have. Um, accounts on what happened next vary. Some say... Estefania fell into a coma following the seizure. Others claim she woke up saying she didn't know what had happened and went about her day. Mm -hmm. I'm leaning more towards the second account, mainly because the articles that reference her recovery are translated from Spanish, and there's more information in those because they're largely referencing interviews with Estefania's family. In any case, assuming Estefania recovered following the seizure, she didn't stay well for long. Um... The next day, Estefania carried on like usual. She went for a walk with her boyfriend, came home, ate dinner with her family, and went to bed a little early. That night at 11 p.m., she had a massive seizure in her bed. Um, Concepcion said she held her daughter's head for about 30 minutes while she seized, foamed at the mouth, uh, before slipping into a coma. That's a long time. Yeah. She was rushed to Gregorio Marañón Hospital, but never regained consciousness and died at 2 a.m., Oh, no. uh, her death has been attributed to both a heart attack and pulmonary asphyxia brought on by a seizure. Um, and forensic specialists that performed her autopsy claimed that Estefania had died suddenly and suspiciously. Oh, whoa. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we'll talk. Put a pin in that one. <laughs> Put a pin in it. Put a pin in it. Sometime before her death, Estefania told her family that she would let them know when she had passed over to the other side by knocking on a door. Ricardo shared that there was a knock on their apartment door at 2 a.m. the exact time oh, she died. Oh, that's weird. Yeah. Um, because obviously the entire family did not go to the hospital mm-hmm. at, when she had to be taken because there are a lot of them. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, there was at least one baby. Oh, so, <laughs> so someone had, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, I can't remember his name. The littlest one was Jose Luis. He was a baby at the time. He was only like one or two. Little guy. Just little. So that is a thing. Uh, Estefani was laid to rest and the family attempted to return to normal. Things seemed to calm down at the apartment on Calle Luis Marin Ocho after Estefania's death. And the paranormal activity subsided. But you've listened to this show for a while now, and you know it doesn't end there. Uh-uh. The activity returned, subtly at first. Doors opening and closing, small objects being moved around the house. Usual beginning stages of a haunting. The usual. The usual. Sadly, the family's peace didn't last, and the activity came back worse than before. Uh-oh. Appliances would shut off on their own before turning themselves back on. That's not good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's not safe. Uh, Objects would fly off shelves. Glasses would shatter. Um, Everything that had happened while Estefani was alive, but worse. Oh, hello, shoulder. Jesus. Uh, Doors and windows slamming open and shut. Mysterious gusts of cold air. Uh, The family dog was tossed across the living room. It was fine from what I could find. Uh, The apparition of an elderly person was seen in the hallway, which led some to believe the activity was brought on by Concepcion's father, who had died five to six months before Estefania. Uh, Concepcion and her father had an allegedly tumultuous relationship that was rumored um, that they'd had a falling out over money. 
Uh, and he'd vowed to make her life miserable when he died. Oh, God. So, maybe. Rude. Yeah. Uh, the family also heard what sounded like the laughter of an old man in the house on several occasions, so I don't know. Maybe Grandpa had returned to make good on his promise. Yikes, I don't like that. I, I don't either. Uh, but that's not all. Uh, Concepcion made sure to keep Estefania's things neat and tidy after she f- after she passed, uh, but would enter the room and find the bed unmade and Estefania's things in complete disarray. Uh, Concepcion noted that a lot of the activity would occur at 11.30 p.m., which is the time Estefania fell into a coma. Mm-hmm. Um, then things turned violent. Uh, a glass was hurled at one of the children's heads. Oof. Uh, they were all shoved on multiple occasions. Maximiliano, one of Estefania's brothers, had a sharpened piece of wood thrown at him while he was in the kitchen making lunch. Good uh, Lord. He claimed that he heard something and kind of ducked out of the way and turned to see a makeshift spear sticking out of the wall. That's insane. Yeah, hate it. Wild. Uh, the little girls had their wrists grabbed and hands smacked against the walls behind their beds. Oh, Lord. Uh, more vicious laughter and whispers unrelated to the elderly male voice. The entire family heard someone or thing moving through the hall at night, scraping against the walls, and it would start to cackle as Absolutely it got close to Estefania's room. Absolutely fucking not. Absolutely yeah. fucking not. To quote the great white menace, Nick... Don't fucking cackle. Uh-uh. Don't fucking cackle. Uh-uh. Um, sometimes the disembodied laughter seemed to be coming from the ceiling, mm. which is rude. It's also rude. worse. I don't. I don't like that. Portals. I don't love that. Uh, there was constant banging on the walls. Doors flung open as if someone had punched or kicked them open. Jesus. The ghost of the Kool Aid Man. <laughs> uh, oh yeah. <laughs> oh no, sir. Uh, Concepcion and Maximo rearranged the furniture, moving heavier items in front of the door in a bid to keep them shut. It did not work. One day, a huge gust of wind blew in from nowhere, causing everything to move out of the way and knocked some things over in the process. Random. Uh, There were fresh claw marks on the walls in Estefania's room, which had long since become a shrine to her. Because I'm assuming Marianella moved into uh, a room with her sister, Cherubina. Mm -hmm. Uh, The door to Estefania's room would slowly open on its own, despite being locked. Absolutely fucking not. Hate it. A crucifix in her room snapped. And a photo of Jesus that had been hanging on the wall suddenly was turned upside down. Oh, no. As were several other photos in the room. They were all upside down. Jesus. Hate it. Hate it. Uh, Concepcion heard Estefania screaming from the bathroom. Oh, no. Mm -mm. But there was obviously no one in there at the time. Uh, They would go go and check just to be like, "Mm, what? Nobody's there. Eventually, uh, Concepcion deemed it too dangerous of a place for anyone to go into alone, uh, so everybody had to have a bathroom buddy. They're like, nope, too, sorry about it. Everybody has to go to the bathroom in pairs. Fair. Which, I mean. I would want to at that point. Yeah. I'd be like, yeah, um, def- you're going to you're gonna see something paranormal either way. <laughs> so, lesser of two evils here is watching me poop. <laughs> To be quite honest. And episode name. <laughs> um, the lesser of two evils is watching me poop. Yep. Yeah. No, no. In, this, on, in this capacity. In, I feel like only then. Um, she also frequently heard her daughter whispering and calling out to her. I don't like that either. Want, want to know what she said? No. Yes. Mama. Uh... Do you imagine, like, your daughter died very tragically, and then sometimes you hear her screaming, and sometimes she is whispering to you. No. I hate that. Don't try and guess. I see the wheels turning in there. Did you just give it away with that line? No. Okay. All right. I I was going to say... What a weird fucking story for that movie to be based yeah, on. No. It's not. Okay. It's not. <laughs> it isn't that one. Uh, but yeah, no thanks. Don't like that. Um, no, if I were covering anything that that movie was based off of, I would be talking about feral children. No, I know. That's but, why I was like, this is not like, this the makes same no sense. at all. No, no, no. You'll, when I, well, you'll, you'll figure it out, I yeah. think. Um, 
So Concepcion frequently felt icy cold hands grab her feet and wrists and hands while she was in bed. Jesus. Which I hate. Uh, she shared that the unseen figure would also yank her sheets. And on multiple occasions, she said that it felt like someone was standing on top of her. Absolutely not. She said, I felt pressure on top of me, but there was no one around. I said to Mr. Gutierrez, there's someone here. I then felt a pair of hands grab my feet and then grab my hand, which were uncovered by the blanket. And this is why you always keep your hands and feet inside of the blankets. That is why. That's, that is 100% why. That's, exa- that's literally, well, just swaddle me like a baby when it's Demons. bedtime. They got them. Mm-hmm. But really, though, swaddle me like a baby. Yeah. So my hands and feet aren't exposed because... The demons are gonna get them. That's just how that's just how they work. That's that's just, that's just science. It's a, it's a scientific rule of demons. <laughs> if I see your hand, I'm gonna touch it. If common, I see your foot, I'm gonna yank it. It's common knowledge, y'all. Come on, it's, get with it. Demons one on one. Right. Welcome to my new class. Um, yeah. So I hate that. Uh, in an interview with Carmen Porter, Marianella recounts some of the activity sharing. Knives flew, cries were heard, doors opened and closed, crosses fell. Uh, I saw a girl about six years old. She never said anything to me, but she was always there. Oh, God. Just suddenly ghost children. And as if creepy ghost kids and faceless shadow figures weren't terrifying enough, it gets worse. Uh, In addition to all of the apparitions and faceless shadow figures the family had been seeing after Estefania's death, some new ones added themselves to the mix. There were more faceless figures, only these ones appeared to be wearing hoods vaguely resembling monks. Ow. Uh, The other one, though, boy do I hate what I'm about to say. This figure was described as a strange, dark, humanoid creature in some places, and others... As a faceless creature, a dark, spiky shadow. Ew. I hate it. So, it reminds me of that weird lion thing fish that you saw one time. Oh, yeah. But hold, please, because it, yeah, it's worse still. Reminds me of the demon from Death Note. Oh, that guy. Yeah. I only know that reference because Netflix pushed that so hard, and then it was it's garbage. Yeah. But just see, I know what you're talking about by yeah, see, like yeah. the visual of it, because it was always there. Um. Yeah, it, it, of course, gets even worse. So Marianella and K. Rubina witnessed the thing throw their toys as it was crawling on their floor towards them. I don't like crawlers. You shouldn't. Uh, the girls tried to turn on a small bedside lamp to scare it off, but the lamp was shaking and moving around so much they couldn't grab onto it. Jesus. Uh, according to Marianella, we heard a whistling sound, like no. on other nights, and then a groan near the door. We were so scared we were frozen. It was then we noticed something on the floor, as the light from the street lights would enter our bedroom and light it up. It was the shape of a man, crawling, dragging itself along the floor. He had a black head, no eyes, no mouth, nothing. It was crawling towards us, and we started to scream. It was then that the toys we had on a shelf started to be thrown violently violently towards the other wall, one by one. And then we heard bangs and shouts. Uh Uh-uh. It's too much. Too much. It's too many things. Too many things. It's too many things. Eventually, they got a hold of the lamp, and as soon as it turned on, the creature vanished. Their parents ran into the room, but didn't see the figure that had been tormenting their daughters. At least, not that night. No, they saw it crawling through the hall a short time later. Oh, no. And this particular entity also made its presence known after it had disappeared by leaving freezing cold spots in its wake. Oh, boy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ew, goo, this guy. Yeah. Another time, the family was gathered near the front door. I'm assuming they were planning on going somewhere or coming home from somewhere. Uh, when a ball came bouncing down the hall towards them. Yes! Uh, Moximo picked it up and threw the ball back down the hallway, but it bounced back towards them without ever having struck a wall or a door. uh uh-uh. So, you know, just imagine throwing a tennis ball into an empty hallway and it bounces back like it's been thrown against a wall, but it didn't because there was no wall there for it to hit. It literally came back towards them after hitting nothing. Uh-uh. I don't. Well, at least not anything human eyes could see in that moment. Uh-uh. No, I don't like that. Uh-uh. Uh, Concepcion attempted some at-home experiments, like shaking flour onto the floors at night, you know, just to see. 
uh, get some further evidence as to what the fuck was going on, which I feel like, I don't know what you're going to do when you get an answer, because, oh boy, you already know. You already know there's something there. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as the flower went, she woke up the next day to find a man's boot prints in it. Oh. Not her husband's, though. Oh. Yeah. Uh, she also tied cords to the doors before leaving the f- house, only to find all the strings broken when they returned. No one was inside the house when she left, by the way. Um, They'd also installed an alarm, which happened to go off when no one was home. You know, real fun stuff like that. Uh, They did call in local paranormal experts as well, but in a surprise to no one, wasn't helpful. Some of them came in and reported getting vertigo near and in the bathroom. And some of them uh, captured EVPs with the voices of a male and female swearing and telling the investigators to leave. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, There was one man by the name of Tristan Breaker, all one word because of course, that weaseled his way into Concepcion and Marianella's good graces. The rest of the family didn't seem to buy what he was selling, and even though they went along for it for Concepcion's sake, they regarded him as a fraud. Mm -hmm. Um, He's allegedly the one that planted the seed that the ghost of Estefania's grandfather was, at least partly, responsible for some of the paranormal activity. Um... So, yeah, he kind of made that up early. I was like, maybe it was your dad. <laughs> After finding out random rumors and gossip about their relationship, mm-hmm. which Marianella claims not entirely true. She's like, because I believe it was uh, dementia that her grandfather had. So he had his good days and bad days. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And aside from that, he was actually a pretty sweet man. So they think that he made that up and kind of just roll rolled with it mm-hmm. but again mm. Mm. um Bye. yeah he also allegedly told them that there was a portal in the bathroom which was the reason why concepcion declared the bathroom too dangerous to go into alone which maybe uh he also told them again allegedly that there was a demon named and i hate what's about to happen but it's unavoidable crapula He was allegedly seen in a red cape and, you know, definitely not inspired by Dracula, probably. <laughs> He's like, yeah, guys, there's a demon in here. His name is Crapula. Come on. Yeah. C-R-A-P. Yeah. U-L-A. Crapula. Yeah. Yep. Oh, come on. Yeah. In a red cape. Ca- uh- I tried to look it up to see if it was an actual thing. I only found one reference. To Crapula. To Crapula in a book related to demons. But it was in Latin. And the word Crapula in Latin, guess what that means? Crap. The end. <laughs> I was like, maybe maybe there's a, like a demon Man, in Spain. This nope. story was so scary for a minute. Oh, don't worry. This guy is full of shit. He's full of shit. Okay. This guy is... 100% full of shit and has nothing to do with the paranormal activity. Okay. He made it, he was like, this is blah, 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 because, so they had a scene, a, like, the demon part, bullshit for sure, but the family had reported seeing a figure in a cape a few times. Okay. So he kind of, I think he just took that and ran with it. His name is Crapula. Yeah, and they're like, oh, of course it is. Why wouldn't it be? <laughs> Sure. I mean, he does live in our bathroom, so stands to reason. Uh, Another paranormal toilet demon, I guess. Um, You know, garbage man. Another fun tidbit is that Tristan Breaker investigated the home for a news segment on October 14th, 1992. Uh, uh So, no, no. Concepcion was the one really buying into this, but more on that later. Wow. Now, all of this had taken place over at least a year following Estefania's death. In November of 1992, Maximo finally reached his breaking point. The activity had reached an all-time high when an unseen force choked Concepcion while she was in bed trying to sleep. Oh, shit. Should also mention that the family had moved mattresses into the living room at this point, and they often slept out there together to be in one place. At the same time, because, you know, strength in numbers. people do when their house is being haunted like that. That's that's a common thing, actually. Yep, it is. We've Um, seen it more than once. mm -hmm. 
Uh, any hoops. Maximo called the police at 2 a.m., frantically begging them to come help. Uh, skepti- skeptical officer and chief inspector Jose Negri and a handful of officers went to the home just to check it out. They're like, maybe someone's drunk. Maybe it's a domestic situation. Sure. We should just check it out just in case. Um, when they arrived, they were met outside of the home by the family, who had been waiting in the cold for the officers to escort them back inside. Mm-hmm. Um... Inside, the home was in disarray, but Officer Negri said that initially it felt calm in there. And by that feeling, was quickly replaced by the ominous feeling you get when you know shit's about to get real weird. Mm -hmm. Uh, The officers moved about the house looking for potential burglars, etc., but couldn't find any signs of forced entry. Uh, Concepcion and Maximo told the officers everything that had been going on and took them to Estefania's room. Um, her room was by far the messiest looking, even though no one really went in there anymore because they'd get pushed whenever they tried. Mm. And so the door to that room was pretty much always locked. Locked. Um, officers further interviewed the family about what had been going on, after which Officer Negri called the station to confirm that the earlier, earlier call from Maximo wasn't a prank and was in fact very much real. Um... Because they did get out of him on the phone. He's like, there's ghosts. We're seeing this tall shadow man and he's tormenting us. Please help. That was kind of the conversation that was had. And they were like, mm, buddy, are you sure you haven't been on the sauce? He's like, no, talk to my wife. And they're like, are you drunk? She's like, no, here is my child. <laughs> Please. And the kids were like, no, shit's weird. Please come. So they're like, yeah, no, it's real. It's, it's real. So... What the officers witnessed that night was written down, making it the first case in Spain where paranormal phenomena was officially documented in a police report. Hmm. Concepcion told Officer Negri that the activity was worse in the dark, so he ordered all the lights to be shut off. As soon as it was dark, activity exploded. Oh boy. Uh, Just like banging, crazy sounds, talking, uh, and then the lights were turned back on and everything stopped. Everyone was still in the living room, huddled together, meaning no one had time to go cause a ruckus in another part of the house. Right. Uh, according to Officer Negri, the inside of the house was colder than outside, and that the bathroom was the coldest room of all, saying, It was a cold unlike anything I've ever felt before. Mm. Among the other things witnessed that evening, sudden cold gusts of wind from nowhere, disembodied whispers and talking, loud bangs, the sudden appearance of a weird goo, which I'll come back to, Uh, The metal Jesus fly off of a wooden crucifix on the wall, and the door of an armor opened by itself in a, and this is a quote from the police report, in a sudden and totally unnatural way. At one point, there was an incredibly loud scream and sound from the terrace, almost as if a boulder or something had been thrown at it or dropped. Oof. But nothing and no one was there. Uh, if you, a lot of fucking noise. Yeah. And if you wanted some highlights from the official report, here you go. Oh, I do. And this is, this is, these are direct quotes. Uh, we sat with the family. You could hear and see how a perfectly shut cupboard door would open and shut. We checked the door. It was perfect. It moved in an anti-natural way. Moments later, we saw a tablecloth on a small telephone table become stained by a brown substance that the uh, inspector identified as drool-like. Yeah. When we checked the bedrooms of the house, we saw a wooden cross spun upside down and the metal Christ upon it was ripped off. One of the daughters then placed the cross behind the door on a poster. Then, in the same moment, there appeared three nail marks or scratches on the poster. They were able to hear and observe how perfectly... Oh, wait, no, I said that. Oh, this is... Uh Uh-oh, hang on. Oh, okay. It was not more than two minutes after we had switched off the light when one of the doors was opened and closed very violently. He turned on the light and we did an inspection to determine why that had happened. Um, They had not come out of the surprise and commenting on it. There was a loud noise on the terrace where they could verify that there was no one. Later, they were able to notice and observe how on the small table that held the telephone and specifically on a tablecloth appeared a consistent brown sti- a consistent brown stain identified as slime. Just slime? Yep. Uh, the report also said that the house was a quote-unquote situation of mystery and rarity, 
and concluded with, there's a series of phenomena that can't be explained. Uh, as for the goo, uh, Officer Negri later would say that he regretted not collecting a sample, a sample. of it. sample? They didn't. Oh, yeah. yeah. But he, he regrets. He has regrets about not doing I'd that. I'd have had regrets about that, too. Shit. Well, we wouldn't have done it. We would have collected it. We would have. So, there's that. Uh, in later in a later interview with the local news, Officer Negri talked about what happened when he entered Estefania's room, saying, It was a small bedroom with twin beds. The father told us that sometimes when he and his little son were sitting on the bed, his son was picked up and thrown onto the other bed in a flying move. Oh, jeez. I sat down in the same bedroom to see if anything would happen. We heard a terrible scream behind us, which came from a small balcony. I quickly opened the door and ran out to see if I could see anything, but there was nothing. No fallen stones. Nothing. It was 2.30 in the morning, and the noise was dreadful. When I'd first entered the room, I noticed they had a large wooden crucifix on the wall, and hanging off of it was a smaller, pearly crucifix like the one children get at their first Holy Communions. There was also a poster, but a few moments later, the crucifix had been turned upside down. The little crucifix was on the floor, and the poster and the door had three or four deep scratches in them, as if someone had clawed through the poster and deep into the door. Uh, he also told interviewer... Um, Iker Jimenez, that most of the other officers left the house to wait outside, saying, only one colleague stayed with me. Oh, damn. Everybody else is like, bye. <laughs> Just Homer Simpson backing into a bush gift. Like, no. Wow. Yeah. They're like, absolutely. fucking Well, that sounds like a lot. It is a lot. It's it, a lot, lot. Just uh, so much happening. Uh, the activity lessened over the years, and on All Saints Day in 1993... It seemed to stop for good. Mm -hmm. uh, that day, a photo of Estefania fell to the floor, and when Concepcion went to pick up the photo, it burst into flames. Flames! We have fire now. Not the glass, not the frame, just the photo inside was burned. Wow. And it was just Estefania's face that was damaged. Huh. That's it. And there is a photo. Two years later, the family sold their home and moved to an undisclosed location in Madrid. Over the years, various family members have given interviews, but their takes on what happened are very different. Uh, Concepcion and Marianella largely agree that what happened was entirely paranormal, while Maximiliano and Ricardo claim it was all due to their mother. Uh, they said that she was deeply religious and had claimed to have paranormal experiences for most of her life. Uh, her sister's son-in-law was allegedly possessed, um, or I'm sorry, her sister-in-law's son mm -hmm. was allegedly possessed by the spirit of a monk, but was cured by a healer. Uh, she was staying with her brother at one point, and a little over a week before she and Maximo got married, she saw a hooded black figure creep towards her in the dark. Uh, she screamed, and her brother ran into the room, but when he turned on the light, nothing was there. Mm-hmm. Uh, according to one of her daughters, before moving into the house at Calle Luis Marin Ocho, the family experienced paranormal activity at their old house. Uh, Cuca, a woman claiming to have been Estefania's close friend, came out and said that Concepcion could be manipulative and controlling uh, and oftentimes straight up ignored her kids, uh, which meant that Estefania was allegedly more of a maternal figure to them than their own actual mother. Okay. Um... She went on to say that Concepcion would have absolutely been the type of person to push her beliefs off onto her kids and cause them to live in constant fear. Um, Kuka also alludes that there was po the possibility of physical abuse, but never elaborated on it. Mm -hmm. um, a number of people came forward to add their two cents into the mix, aiming for their own 15 minutes of fame. Some people claimed that they were there when the seance took place. Uh, while well, other people said that uh, Estefania had never even touched a board before, um, a lot of people were like, oh, it was me and this guy, and she just kind of showed up. It was our, like, trying to, you know, like, mm -hmm. it was me, it's all about me, 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 which, mm -hmm. please shut up. Um, as for the sudden stop in paranormal activity, some people believe that it ended when the family had Estefania exhumed so they could make good on her request of having a photo of her and her father buried with her. That, however, is a bit of an exaggeration. Estefania was exhumed in October of 1996, but it was only to remove another family member that was buried beneath her. Oh, okay. It was, it's a tomb. Mm -hmm. um, 
So her family just happened to take that opportunity and place the requested photo on her coffin before closing up the tomb again. Probably just a coincidence that the activity stopped not long after that. Probably. Uh, renewed interest in the case came in 2017 when Spanish filmmaker Paco Plaza's film Veronica was released. Uh, the film was loosely based on the Vallecas case and was called one of the scariest movies of the year in 2017. Neighbors of the Gutierrez Lazaro family were interviewed after it came out and largely denied any supernatural goings-ons. While medical professionals failed to diagnose Estefania with any health conditions, doctors now believe she may have truly been an epileptic. Um, she was also said to have not been in the best physical shape at the time, which may have contributed to her tragic young death. Mm -hmm. um, but medical reports, at least what little parts I could find, say that it was kind of like a double whammy. Kind of like how when Errol Flynn died, it was just a matter of like, which one's going to get you first? Mm -hmm. uh, kind of similar, because... It was a heart attack and pulmonary asphyxia, which they believe she had a seizure in bed in the hospital and just stopped breathing and died. Mm -hmm. And it went into, like, the seizure caused a cardiac incident, and then she stopped breathing and died. So they're right. like, mm -hmm. But then, I mean, there's also the police report. The cop was seeing something. Oh, yeah. No, no. So I'll get there. Happening. But and the brothers have later been like... Officer Negri is a liar. Oh, we okay. did some of these things, but... Oh, okay. Oh, hard to say for sure, because, you know, yeah. none, none of us were there. Um, so, yeah, all said, no one truly knows the real story of everything that happened to Estefania and her family. Was she just a sick, untreated young woman in need of medical and psychiatric care? Was she the victim of abuse? Was she responsible for the alleged poltergeist activity in the home, in both life and death? Something else entirely? Or was it all a hoax? Most likely never really know. As for the new owners of the house on Calle Luis Marin Ocho, they say they've never experienced any parano paranormal activity in the home. Huh. And that is the Vallecas case, the alleged possession of Estefania Gutierrez Lazaro. Interesting. Yes. Sources uh, ABC.es, Lorraine Lopez, Prezi.com, Jennifer Libanas, Reddit, user Resaco6, Quattro.com, Ranker Jacob Shelton, Vocal.media, Dalip Singh, TheSun.co.uk, Joanne Kavanaugh, Unfakely.com, Bo, Ethan, and Luca. Wattpad.com, Dali Angelis, uh, Perergaya.org, uh, Alberto Romo, which was a very helpful, uh, Oralcrave.com, Carlo Afaticato, mm -hmm. ScreenRant.com, Elizabeth Lerman, Newsweek.com, Andrew Whalen, AtticVoices.com, Maggie Kendall, GhostWatch.net, GhostTheory.com, Xavier, Educa. 2.madrid.org was where I found information about the school. Uh, AboveTopSecret.com, UserAndy1972, HopkinsMedicine.org, AlteredDimensions.net, UserDimensions, and Bayecas, let's see, BayecasTodoCultura.org. All right, shit. Yeah, and the movie Veronica is good. Mm -hmm. It is very loosely based. Mm -hmm. Very loosely based. And that's why I think some of the sources, at least in the States, mm -hmm. um, pull more from the movie mm -hmm. than the actual case. Because there's not a ton of information. What was the movie one more time? I'm sorry. Veronica. Mm. Veronica. Spanish film. Mm. I wouldn't have guessed. I didn't think you would. Yeah. But, I mean, if you'd seen it. I don't know. Did you see that one? You did say. You'll figure it out. So, I think you did think I would. I did. You're right. <laughs> I lied. I assumed you'd seen it, because I feel like we talked about it. Maybe we did. Maybe I did. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's good. I didn't say it, so. It's there good. You go. Loosely based. Loosely based. Uh, but the director is from Spain, and it's a very familiar story over there. Like It's one of the kind of like an Enfield situation where everybody in the area knows about right. it. Um. 
But yeah, it's just kind of his take on what happened. Okay. But it is a good movie. Interesting. Would it? Would I call it the scariest? I thought you were. No. Uh, <laughs> at the beginning of this, was like, did she really do an entire story about Ouija to N- spite me? No, because that would have had to. I would have had to start that a long time ago. Because that conversation happened yesterday when yeah. I was finishing. No, I know. So no, I know. For a, I did for a split second like <laughs> that. That's an impressive level. I cannot work that fast, <laughs> no matter how much I wish I could. But no, no. As far as that, the only thing we disagreed on was the ladies acting, because I didn't care. It didn't bother me. Sure. But it bothered what you. What movie? Ouija, uh, Ouija. Origin of Evil. Origin of Evil. Oh. It was the prequel to Ouija. the Ouija board yeah, movie. I haven't seen any of them. It's, so. it's They're fun. Good. I just, uh, you know, I didn't I didn't care for the ending that much. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, shit. Lady's very nonchalant about losing her entire family. Wow. Mm-hmm. I was like, mm-hmm. her acting didn't really didn't bother me. Because hmm. also, it was just a fun movie. Sure. I was like, oh, whatever. Yeah. I didn't even think about it until well, you brought I it up. I might have to check out Veronica then. It's good. Worth it? Yeah. I liked it. Cool. Uh, but I would yeah, also say just... Ouija's worth it. It's on Netflix. It's yeah. fun. It's fun. Oh. Uh, but yeah, it was like interesting. Again, difficult to find tons of facts because mm. dates are all over the place mm. when you research this one. Yeah. Uh, dates, certain times. So that was a pain in my ass, but a very interesting case nonetheless. All right. <laughs> Just sitting there popping and locking. Yeah, no dropping. <laughs> not today. today. No. Not today. I dropped something earlier. I was like, oh no. Because it was, what did I drop? I think it was like a cracker or something. And I didn't want Hawkeye to have it. And so I was like, oh no. I have to bend. This is going to be a nightmare. And so I bent over to pick it up. And my back was like, you dumb bitch. <laughs> Surprise. Guess who also hurts? It's me. I'm like, but why? why? I didn't do anything. But why? Yeah, it's been a fucking week. Sorry, boo. That's all right. Well, oh, shit. And I, I was very concerned because I had to finish this and also do homework for my class oh, tomorrow. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh. And because my brain is, as we know, piloted by an evil goblin, mm-hmm. I was... He was like, you have to be the very first one to turn in your assignments every week. I'm like, okay, number one, that happened one time. And it doesn't need, I don't have to turn in my assignment first every week. No, you don't. The goblin begs to differ. Mm. So I was very concerned, mostly because I did it to myself. But (laughs) I finished it. Like, I took a break from writing this yesterday. And I was like, let's just do our homework really quick. And you started it. It won't take you very long. I was right about that. So I finished it, and I went to upload it to our class work folder Mm -hmm. yet again the first person (laughs) turned it in still after all the stress i was still the first person to turn something in i was like what but now what else are you guys doing how is the hell i the first one i don't know i don't either i was more confused than impressed i was like (laughs) is this actually due tomorrow yeah when i was like oh well you know what all right then oh cool but yeah it's done now is it right i don't know I did it. That's you'll, all. That's all that matters right now is that it's it's done. You'll find out. I'm sure it is fine. You'll find out. So. I shall. I shall. Uh, but yeah, right. then I have to. Let's see what time is it. Four. Uh, yep. I gotta go pick up my mom from the airport in a little bit. All right. Well, yay, mom's in town. Mm-hmm. So well, we done done it, y'all. We did done do it. We done done it, y'all. You know the drill. Rate, review, subscribe, share, share, share. Mm-hmm. If you'd like some exclusive motherfucking content, go become a patron on our Patreon. Yes, please. Yeah, go on. Oh, yeah. Looking at you, kid. <laughs> I appreciate you throwing it to me every week, man. Uh, go check out the Anytime Now Children's History Podcast and go to honesthistory.co mm-hmm. yep. uh, and use the promo code GNH to get 10% off your first purchase of uh, dope shit for your kids. Yeah. Yep. Dope shit for kids. It's dope. It's dope history shit for kids. Dope. Word. I could go into great detail, but I think that would be a little uh, unnecessary. G and H. 
Yeah, there you go. And again, you know, G is do in the ghost. things. N is in mm. H is in house. <laughs> N is in mm. 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 Ooh. Mm. Oh, Jesus! Just what is up. happening? Yeah. You've been popping all day. Yeah, I know. It just does that. Some usually not this much though. You're fucking falling apart. Something gross is happening in there. Right, well, like it's real icky in my shoulder, uh-huh. neck situation. Yeah, I can tell. Yeah, so go do the, the, the store thing that he always tells you to do. Honesthistory.co. No. no. The, uh, the, oh, shit. The, I mean, yeah, yes, to, but also Go no. to a retail store, uh, sign up. Or, Subscribe to our podcast, goddammit. On, on at least five devices, take a video of yourself doing it, we'll send you something cool. Yeah. yeah. There you go. There's that. All That's right. what we were talking about. That's it. That's what we were saying. So, yeah. well, till next time, y'all. Hexes and hoes, y'all. Hexes and hoes, y'all. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Mwah. Hats off to the fuck you club. Yeah. Today, top of my list is going to be Arthur motherfucking Rathburn. Yeah, Yeah, that fucking guy. And I'm going to throw in all unscrupulous body brokers. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. And And I just want to throw a little one to fucking Tristan Breaker and his his main boy, Crapula. Crapula? (laughs) I can't, can't, dude. I'm going to find it. I can't. Hang on. Keep talking for just a second because I I have to show you what this guy looks like. Fucking Crapula, bro. Well, and then, I mean, fuck you, Bob. Fuck you, Always. Bob. Fuck you, Gwyneth. Fuck you, Gwyneth. Kimberly can't read and eat a million razor blade filled dicks, Ted. Yeah. Just Always. Gurgle them, gargle them. This picture is even more. Roll one around. <laughs> okay, this was not the picture I was looking up for this guy. Oh, here's the one. This is. This de- there's a demon in your home. Ted's wearing a, a red cape. His name is Crappy. This is Tristan Breaker. Stop okay. it. Stop it right now. Stop it okay. right now. Someone's trying a little He's too hard. Crapula. Is Maybe. he wearing a cape? He's, uh, I can't tell from this photo, but it's entirely possible. It looks like a cape. He is Crapula, the end. Here you go. Oh, Jesus. What an asshat. <laughs> yeah. So, I am Crapula. Especially to this guy for taking advantage of a grieving, terrified family. Crapula. You fucking. He looks like a shit bird. I'm gonna crap you on his chest. <laughs> he might be into that. That's what we're going for. Oh shit. He might be into that. Oh.